section number twenty six of emile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by naomi brewster melbourne australia emile by jean jacques rousseau translated by barbara foxley the creed of a savoyard priest part one my child do not look to me for learned speeches or profound arguments i am no great philosopher nor do i desire to be one i have however a certain amount of common sense and a constant devotion to truth i have no wish to argue with you nor even to convince you it is enough for me to show you in all simplicity of heart what i really think consult your own heart while i speak that is all i ask if i am mistaken i am honestly mistaken and therefore my error will not be counted to me as a crime if you too are honestly mistaken there is no great harm done if i am right we are both endowed with reason we have both the same motive for listening to the voice of reason why should you not think as i do by birth i was a peasant and poor to till the ground was my portion but my parents thought it a finer thing that i should learn to get my living as a priest and they found means to send me to college i am quite sure that neither my parents nor i had any idea of seeking what was good useful or true we only sought what was wanted to get me ordained i learned what was taught me i said what i was told to say i promised all that was required and i became a priest but i soon discovered that when i promised not to be a man i had promised more than i could perform conscience they tell us is the creature of prejudice but i know from experience that conscience persists in following the order of nature in spite of all the laws of man in vain is this or that forbidden remorse makes her voice heard but feebly when what we do is permitted by well-ordered nature and still more when we are doing her bidding my good youth nature has not yet appealed to your senses may you long remain in this happy state when her voice is the voice of innocence remember that to anticipate her teaching is to offend more deeply against her than to resist her teaching you must first learn to resist that you may know when to yield without wrong-doing from my youth up i had reverenced the married state as the first and most sacred institution of nature having renounced the right to marry i was resolved not to profane the sanctity of marriage for in spite of my education and reading i had always led a simple and regular life and my mind had preserved the innocence of its natural instincts these instincts had not been obscured by worldly wisdom while my poverty kept me remote from the temptations dictated by the sophistry of vice this very resolution proved my ruin my respect for marriage led to the discovery of my misconduct the scandal must be expiated i was arrested suspended and dismissed i was the victim of my scruples rather than of my incontinence and i had reason to believe from the reproaches which accompanied my disgrace that one can often escape punishment by being guilty of a worse fault a thoughtful mind soon learns from such experiences i found my former ideas of justice honesty and every duty of man overturned by these painful events and day by day i was losing my hold on one or another of the opinions i had accepted what was left was not enough to form a body of ideas which could stand alone and i felt that the evidence on which my principles rested was being weakened at last i knew not what to think and i came to the same conclusion as yourself but with this difference my lack of faith was the slow growth of manhood attained with great difficulty and all the harder to uproot 
i was in that state of doubt and uncertainty which descartes considers essential to the search of truth it is a state which cannot continue it is disquieting and painful only vicious tendencies and an idle heart can keep us in that state my heart was not so corrupt as to delight in it and there is nothing which so maintains the habit of thinking as been better pleased with one's self than with one's lot i pondered therefore on the sad state of mortals adrift upon the sea of human opinions without compass or rudder and abandoned to their stormy passions with no guide but an inexperienced pilot who does not know whence he comes or whither he is going i said to myself i love truth i seek her and i cannot find her show me truth and i will hold her fast why does she hide her face from the eager heart which would fain worship her although i have often experienced worse sufferings i have never led a life so uniformly distressing as this period of unrest and anxiety when i wandered incessantly from one doubt to another gaining nothing from my prolonged meditations but uncertainty darkness and contradiction with regard to the source of my being and the rule of my duties i cannot understand how any one can be a sceptic sincerely and on principle either such philosophers do not exist or they are the most miserable of men doubt with regards to what we ought to know is a condition too violent for the human mind it cannot long be endured in spite of itself the mind decides one way or another and it prefers to be deceived rather than to believe nothing my perplexity was increased by the fact that i had been brought up in a church which decides everything and permits no doubts so that having rejected one article of faith i was forced to reject the rest as i could not accept absurd decisions i was deprived of those which were not absurd when i was told to believe everything i could believe nothing and knew not where to stop i consulted the philosophers i searched their books and examined their various theories i found them all alike proud assertive dogmatic professing even in their so-called scepticism to know everything proving nothing scoffing at each other this last trait which was common to all of them struck me as the only point in which they were right braggarts in attack they are weaklings in defence weigh their arguments they are all destructive count their voices every one speaks for himself they are only agreed in arguing with each other i could find no way out of my uncertainty by listening to them i suppose this prodigious diversity of opinion is caused in the first place by the weakness of the human intellect and in the second by pride we have no means of measuring this vast machine we are unable to calculate its workings we know neither its guiding principles nor its final purpose we do not know ourselves we know neither our nature nor the spirit that moves us we scarcely know whether man is one or many we are surrounded by impenetrable mysteries these mysteries are beyond the region of sense we think we can penetrate them by the light of reason but we fall back on our imagination through this imagined world each forces a way for himself which he holds to be right none can tell whether his path will lead him to the goal yet we long to know and understand it all the one thing we do not know is the limit of the knowable we prefer to trust to chance and to believe what is not true rather than to own that not one of us can see what really is a fragment of some vast whole whose bounds are beyond our gaze a fragment abandoned by its creator to our foolish quarrels we are vain enough to want to determine the nature of that whole and our own relations with regard to it if the philosophers were in a position to declare the truth which of them would care to do so 
every one of them knows that his own system rests on no surer foundations than the rest but he maintains it because it is his own there is not one of them who if he chanced to discover the difference between truth and falsehood would not prefer his own lie to the truth which another had discovered where is the philosopher who would not deceive the whole world for his own glory if he can rise above the crowd if he can excel his rivals what more does he want among believers he is an atheist among atheists he would be a believer the first thing i learned from these considerations was to restrict my inquiries to what directly concerned me to rest in profound ignorance of everything else and not even to trouble myself to doubt anything beyond what i required to know i also realized that the philosophers far from ridding me of my vain doubts only multiplied the doubts that tormented me and failed to remove any one of them so i chose another guide and said let me follow the inner light it will not lead me so far astray as others have done or if it does it will be my own fault i shall not go far wrong if i follow my own illusions as if i trusted to their deceits i then went over in my mind the various opinions which i had held in the course of my life and i saw that although no one of them was plain enough to gain immediate belief some were more probable than others and my inward consent was given or withheld in proportion to this improbability having discovered this i had an unprejudiced comparison of all these different ideas and i perceived that the first and most general of them was also the simplest and the most reasonable and that it would have been accepted by every one if only it had been the last instead of the first imagine all your philosophers ancient and modern having exhausted their strange systems of force chance fate necessity atoms a living world animated matter and every variety of materialism then comes the illustrious clark who gives light to the world and proclaims the beings of beings and the giver of things what universal admiration what unanimous applause would have greeted this new system a system so great so illuminating and so simple other systems are full of absurdities this system seems to me to contain fewer things which are beyond the understanding of the human mind i said to myself every system has its insoluble problems for the finite mind of man is too small to deal with them these difficulties are therefore no final arguments against any system but what a difference there is between the direct evidence on which these systems are based should we not prefer that theory which alone explains all the facts when it is no more difficult than the rest bearing thus within my heart the love of truth as my only philosophy and as my only method a clear and simple rule which dispensed with the need for vain and subtle arguments i returned with the help of this rule to the examination of such knowledge as concerned myself i was resolved to admit as self-evident all that i could not honestly refuse to believe and to admit as true all that seemed to follow directly from this all the rest i determined to leave undecided neither accepting nor rejecting it nor yet troubling myself to clear up difficulties which did not lead to any practical ends but who am i what right have i to decide what is it that determines my judgments if they are inevitable if they are the results of the impressions i receive i am wasting my strength in such inquiries they would be made or not without any interference of mine i must therefore first turn my eyes upon myself to acquaint myself with the instruments i desire to use and to discover how far it is reliable i exist and i have senses through which i receive impressions this is the first truth that strikes me and i am forced to accept it have i any independent knowledge of my existence or am i only aware of it through my sensations this is my first difficulty 
and so far i cannot solve it for i continually experience sensations either directly or indirectly through memory so how can i know if the feeling of self is something beyond these sensations or if it can exist independently of them my sensations take place in myself for they make me aware of my own existence but their cause is outside me for they affect me whether i have any reason for them or not and they are produced or destroyed independently of me so i clearly perceive that my sensation which is written within me and its cause or its object which is outside me are different things thus not only do i exist but other entities exist also that is to say the objects of my sensations and even if these objects are merely ideas still these ideas are not me but everything outside myself everything which acts upon my senses i call matter and all the particles of matter which i suppose to be united into separate entities i call bodies thus all the disputes of the idealists and the realists have no meaning for me their distinctions between the appearance and the reality of bodies are wholly fanciful i am now as convinced of the existence of the universe as of my own i next consider the objects of my sensations and i find that i have the power of comparing them so i perceive that i am endowed with an active force of which i was not previously aware to perceive is to feel to compare is to judge to judge and to feel are not the same through sensation objects present themselves to me separately and singularly as they are in nature by comparing them i rearrange them i shift them so to speak i place one upon another to decide whether they are alike or different or more generally to find out their relations to my mind the distinctive faculty of an active or intelligent being is the power of understanding this word is i speak in vain in the merely sensitive entity the intelligent force which compares and judges i can find no trace of it in nature this passive entity will be aware of each object separately it will even be aware of the whole formed by the two together but having no power to place them side by side it can never compare them it can never form a judgment with regard to them to see two things at once is not to see their relations nor to judge of their differences to perceive several objects one beyond the other is not to relate them i may have at the same moment an idea of a big stick and a little stick without comparing them without judging that one is less than the other just as i can see my whole hand without counting my fingers footnote m d lecordamine's narratives tell of a people who can only know how to count up to three yet the men of this nation having hands have often seen their fingers without learning to count up to five End of footnote. these comparative ideas greater smaller together with number ideas of one two etc are certainly not sensations though my mind only produces them when my sensations occur we are told that a sensitive being distinguishes sensations from each other by the inherent differences in the sensations this requires explanation when the sensations are different the sensitive being distinguishes them by their differences when they are alike he distinguishes them because he is aware of them one beyond the other otherwise how could he distinguish between two equal objects simultaneously experienced he would necessarily confound the two objects and take them for one object especially under a system which professed that the representative sensations of space have no extension when we become aware of the two sensations to be compared their impression is made each object is perceived both are perceived but for all that their relation is not perceived if the judgment of this relation were merely a sensation and came to me solely from the object itself my judgments would never be mistaken for it is never untrue that i feel what i feel 
why then am i mistaken as to the relation between these two sticks especially when they are not parallel why for example do i say that the small stick is a third of the large when it is only a quarter why is the picture which is the sensation unlike its model which is the object it is because i am active when i judge because the operation of comparison is at fault because my understanding which judges of relations mingles its errors with the truth of sensations which only reveal to me things add to this a consideration which will i feel sure appeal to you when you have thought about it it is this if we were purely passive in the use of our senses there would be no communication between them it would be impossible to know that the body we are touching and the thing we are looking at is the same either we should never perceive anything outside ourselves or there would be for us five substances perceptible by the senses whose identity we should have no means of perceiving this power of my mind which brings my sensations together and compares them may be called by any name let it be called attention meditation reflection or what you will it is still true that it is in me and not in things that it is i alone who produce it though i only produce it when i receive an impression from things though i am compelled to feel or not to feel i am free to examine more or less what i feel being now so to speak sure of myself i begin to look at things outside myself and i behold myself with a sort of shudder flung at random into this vast universe plunged as it were into the vast number of entities knowing nothing of what they are in themselves or in relation to me i study them i observe them and the first object which suggests itself for comparison with them is myself all that i perceive through the senses is matter and i deduce all the essential properties of matter from the sensible qualities which make me perceive it qualities which are inseparable from it i see it sometimes in motion sometimes at rest hence i infer that neither motion nor rest is essential to it but motion being an action is the result of a cause of which rest is only the absence footnote this repose is if you prefer it merely relative but as we perceive more or less of motion we may plainly conceive one of two extremes which is rest and we conceive it so clearly that we are even disposed to take for absolute rest what is only relative but it is not true that motion is of the essence of matter if matter may be conceived of us at rest End of footnote. when therefore there is nothing acting upon matter it does not move and for the very reason that rest and motion are indifferent to it its natural state is a state of rest i perceive two sorts of motions of bodies acquired motion and spontaneous or voluntary motion in the first the cause is external to the body moved in the second it is within i shall not conclude from that that motion say of a watch is spontaneous for if no external cause operated upon the spring it would run down and the watch would cease to go for the same reason i should not admit that the movements of fluids are spontaneous neither should i attribute spontaneous motion to fire which causes their fluidity footnote chemists regard phlogiston or the element of fire as diffused motionless and stagnant in the compounds of which it forms part until external forces sets it free collect it and set it in motion and change it into fire End of footnote. you ask of me if the movements of animals are spontaneous my answer is i cannot tell you but analogy points that way you ask me again how do i know that there are spontaneous movements i tell you i know it because i feel them i want to move my arm and i move it without any other immediate cause of the movement 
but my own will in vain would any one try to argue me out of this feeling it is stronger than any proofs you might as well try to convince me that i do not exist if there is no spontaneity in men's actions nor anything that happens on this earth it would be all the more difficult to imagine a first cause for all motion for my own part i feel myself so thoroughly convinced that the natural state of matter is a state of rest and that it has no power of action in itself that when i see a body in motion i at once assume that it is either a living body or that this motion has been imparted to it my mind declines to accept in any way the idea of inorganic matter moving of its own accord or giving any rise to any action yet this visible universe consists of matter matter diffused and dead matter which has none of the cohesion the organization the common feeling of the parts of a living body for it is certain that we who are parts have no consciousness of the whole footnote i have tried hard to grasp the idea of a living molecule but in vain the idea of matter feeling without any senses seems to me unintelligible and self-contradictory to accept or reject this idea one must first understand it and i confess that so far i have not succeeded End of footnote. this same universe is in motion and in its movements ordered uniform and subject to fixed laws it has none of that freedom which appears in the spontaneous movements of men and animals so the world is not some huge animal which moves of its own accord its movements are therefore due to some external cause a cause which i cannot perceive but the inner voice makes this cause so apparent to me that i cannot watch the course of the sun without imagining a force which drives it and when the earth revolves i think i can see the hand that sets it in motion if i must accept general laws whose essential relation to matter is unperceived by me how much further have i got these laws not being real things but being substances have therefore some other basis unknown to me experiment and observation have acquainted us with the laws of motion these laws determine the results without showing their causes they are quite inadequate to explain the system of the world and the course of the universe with the help of dice descartes made heaven and earth but he could not set his dice in motion nor start the action of his centrifugal force without the help of rotation newton discovered the law of gravitation but gravitation alone would soon reduce the universe to a motionless mass he was compelled to add a projectile force to account for the elliptical course of the celestial bodies let newton show us the hand that launched the planets in the tangent of their orbits end of section twenty six section twenty seven of emile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org emile by jean jacques rousseau translated by barbara foxley the creed of the savoyard priest part two the first causes of motion are not to be found in matter matter receives and transmits motion but does not produce it the more i observe the action and reaction of the forces of nature playing on one another the more i see that we must always go back from one effect to another till we arrive at a first cause in some will for to assume an infinite succession of causes is to assume that there is no first cause in a word no motion which is not caused by another motion can take place except by a spontaneous voluntary action inanimate bodies have no action but motion and there is no real action without will 
this is my first principle i believe therefore that there is a will which sets the universe in motion and gives life to nature this is my first dogma or the first article of my creed how does a will produce a physical and corporeal action i cannot tell but i perceive that it does so in myself i will to do something and i do it i will to move my body and it moves but if an inanimate body when at rest should begin to move itself the thing is incomprehensible and without precedent the will is known to me in its action not its nature i know this will as a cause of motion but to conceive of matter as producing motion is clearly to conceive of an effect without a cause which is not to conceive at all it is no more possible for me to conceive how my will moves my body than to conceive how my sensations affect my mind i do not even know why one of these mysteries has seemed less inexplicable than the other for my own part whether i am active or passive the means of union of the two substances seem to me absolutely incomprehensible it is very strange that people make this very incomprehensibility a step towards the compounding of the two substances as if operations so different in kind were more easily explained in one case than in two the doctrine i have just laid down is indeed obscure but at least it suggests a meaning and there is nothing in it repugnant to reason or experience can we say as much of materialism is it not plain that if motion is essential to matter that it would be inseparable from it it would always be present in it in the same degree always present in every particle of matter always the same in each particle of matter it would not be capable of transmission it would neither increase nor diminish nor could we ever conceive of matter at rest when you tell me that motion is not essential to matter but necessary to it you try to cheat me with words which would be easier to refute if there was a little more sense in them for either the motion of matter arises from the matter itself and is therefore essential to it or it arises from an external cause and is not necessary to the matter because the motive cause acts upon it we have got back to our original difficulty the chief source of human error is to be found in general and abstract ideas the jargon of metaphysics has never led to the discovery of any single truth and it has filled philosophy with absurdities of which we are ashamed as soon as we strip them of their long words tell me my friend when they talk to you of a blind force diffused throughout nature do they present any real idea to your mind they think they are saying something of these vague expressions universal force essential motion but they are saying nothing at all the idea of motion is nothing more than the idea of transference from place to place there is no motion without direction for no individual can move always at once in what direction then does matter move of necessity has the whole body of matter a uniform motion or has each atom its own motion according to the first idea the whole universe must form a solid and indivisible mass according to the second it can only form a diffused and incoherent fluid which would make the union of any two atoms impossible what direction shall be taken by this motion common to all matter shall it be in a straight line in a circle or from above downwards to the right or to the left if each molecule has its own direction what are the causes of all these directions and all these differences if each molecule or atom only revolved on its own axis nothing would ever leave its place and there would be no transmitted motion and even then this circular movement would require to follow some direction to set matter in motion by an abstraction is to utter words without meaning 
and to attribute to matter a given direction is to assume a determining cause the more examples i take the more causes i have to explain without ever finding a common agent which controls them far from being able to picture to myself an entire absence of order in the fortuitous concurrence of elements i cannot even imagine such a strife and the chaos of the universe is less conceivable to me than its harmony i can understand that the mechanism of the universe may not be intelligible to the human mind but when a man sets to work to explain it he must say what men can understand if matter in motion points me to a will matter in motion according to fixed laws points me to an intelligence that is the second article of my creed to act to compare to choose are the operations of an active thinking being so this being exists where do you find him existing you will say not merely in the revolving heavens nor in the sun which gives us light not in myself alone but in the sheep that grazes the bird that flies the stone that falls and the leaf blown by the wind i judge the order of the world although i know nothing of its purpose for to judge of its order is enough for me to compare the parts of one with another to study their cooperation their relations and to observe their united action i know not why the universe exists but i see continually how it is changed i never fail to perceive the close connection by which the entities of which it consists led their aid one to another i am like a man who sees the works of a watch for the first time he is never weary of admiring the mechanism though he does not know the use of the instrument and has never seen its face i do not know what this is for says he but i see that each part of it is fitted to the rest i admire the workman in the detail of his work and i am quite certain that all these wheels only work together in this fashion for some common end which i cannot perceive let us compare the special ends the means the ordered relations of every kind then let us listen to the inner voice of feeling what healthy mind can reject its evidence unless the eyes are blinded by prejudices can they fail to see that the visible order of the universe proclaims a supreme intelligence what sophisms must be brought together before we fail to understand the harmony of existence and the wonderful cooperation of every part for the maintenance of the rest say what you will of combinations and probabilities what do you gain by reducing me to silence if you cannot gain my consent and how can you rob me of the spontaneous feeling which in spite of myself continually gives you the lie if organized bodies had come together fortuitously in all sorts of ways before assuming settled forms if stomachs are made without mouths feet without heads hands without arms imperfect organs of every kind which died because they could not preserve their life why do none of these imperfect attempts now meet our eyes why has nature at length prescribed laws to herself which she did not at first recognize i must not be surprised if that which is possible should happen and if the improbability of the event is compensated for by the number of the attempts i grant this yet if any one told me that printed characters scattered broadcast had produced the aeneid all complete i would not condescend to take a single step to verify this falsehood you will tell me i am forgetting the multitude of attempts but how many such attempts must i assume to bring the combinations within the bounds of probability for my own part the only possible assumption is that the chances are infinity to one that the product is not the work of chance in addition to this chance combinations yield nothing but product of the same nature as the elements combined so that life and organization will not be produced by a flow of atoms and a chemist when making his compounds will never give them thought and feeling in his crucible footnote could one believe if one had not seen it that human absurdity could go so far 
amatrus lusitanus asserts that he saw a little man an inch long enclosed in a glass which julius camillus like a second prometheus had made by alchemy paracelsus de natura rerum teaches the method of making these tiny men and he maintains that the pygmies fauns satyrs and nymphs have been made by chemistry indeed i cannot see that there is anything more to be done to establish the possibility of these facts unless it is to assert that organic matter resists the heat of fire and that its molecules can preserve their life in the hottest furnace End footnote. i was surprised and almost shocked when i read Nuwintet how could this man desire to make a book out of the wonders of nature wonders that show the wisdom of the author of nature his book would have been as large as the world itself before he had exhausted his subject and as soon as we attempt to give details the greatest wonder of all the concord and harmony of the whole escapes us the mere generation of living organic bodies is the despair of the human mind the insurmountable barrier raised by nature between the various species so that they should not mix with one another is the clearest proof of her intention she is not content to have established order she has taken adequate measures to prevent the disturbance of that order there is not a being in the universe which may not be regarded as in some respects the common centre of all around which they are grouped so that they are all reciprocally end and means in relation to each other the mind is confused and lost amid these innumerable relations not one of which is itself confused or lost in the crowd what absurd assumptions are required to deduce all this harmony from the blind mechanism of matter set in motion by chance in vain do those who deny the unity of intention manifested in the relations of all the parts of this great whole in vain do they conceal their nonsense under abstractions coordinations general principles symbolic expressions whatever they do i find it impossible to conceive of a system of entities so firmly ordered unless i believe in an intelligence that orders them it is not in my power to believe that passive and dead matter can have brought forth living and feeling beings that blind chance has brought forth intelligent beings that that which does not think has brought forth thinking beings i believe therefore that the world is governed by a wise and powerful will i see it or rather feel it and it is a great thing to know this but has this same world always existed or has it been created is there one source of all things are there two or many what is their nature i know not and what concern is it of mine when these things become of importance to me i will try to learn them till then i abjure these idle speculations which may trouble my peace but cannot affect my conduct nor be comprehended by my reason recollect that i am not preaching my own opinion but explaining it whether matter is eternal or created whether its origin is passive or not it is still certain that the whole is one and that it proclaims a single intelligence for i see nothing that is not part of the same ordered system nothing which does not cooperate to the same end namely the conservation of all within the established order this being who wills and can perform his will this being active through his own power this being whoever he may be who moves the universe and orders all things is what i call god to this name i add the ideas of intelligence power will which i have brought together and that of kindness which is their necessary consequence but for all this i know no more of the being to which i ascribe them he hides himself alike from my senses and my understanding the more i think of him the more perplexed i am i know full well that he exists and that he exists for himself alone 
i know that my existence depends on his and that everything i know depends upon him also i see god everywhere in his works i feel him within myself i behold him all around me but if i try to ponder him himself if i try to find out where he is what he is what is his substance he escapes me and my troubled spirit finds nothing convinced of my unfitness i shall never argue about the nature of god unless i am driven to it by the feelings of his relations within myself such reasonings are always rash a wise man should venture on them with trembling he should be certain that he can never sound their abysses for the most insolent attitude towards god is not to abstain from thinking of him but to think evil of him after the discovery of such of his attributes as enable me to conceive of his existence i return to myself and i try to discover what is my place in the order of things which he governs and i can myself examine at once and beyond possibility of doubt i discover my species for by my own will and the instruments i control to carry out my will i have more power to act upon all bodies about me either to make use of or to avoid their action at my pleasure than any of them has power to act upon me against my will by mere physical impulsion and through my intelligence i am the only one who can examine all the rest what being here below except man can observe others measure calculate forecast their motions their effects and unite so to speak the feeling of a common existence with that of his individual existence what is there so absurd in the thought that all things are made for me when i alone can relate all things to myself it is true therefore that man is lord of the earth on which he dwells for not only does he tame all the beasts not only does he control its elements through his industry but he alone knows how to control it by contemplation he takes possession of the stars which he cannot approach show me any other creature on earth who can make a fire and who can behold with admiration the sun what can i observe and know all creatures and their relations can i feel what is meant by order beauty and virtue can i consider the universe and raise myself towards the hand that guides it can i love good and perform it and should i then liken myself to the beasts wretched soul it is your gloomy philosophy which makes you like the beasts or rather in vain do you seek to degrade yourself your genius belies your principles your kindly heart belies your doctrine and even the abuse of your powers proves their excellence in your own despite for myself i am not pledged to the support of any system i am a plain and honest man one who is not carried away by party spirit one who has no ambition to be head of a sect i am content with the place where god has set me i see nothing next to god himself which is better than my species and if i had to choose my place in the order of creation what more could i choose than to be a man i am not puffed up by this thought i am deeply moved by it for this state was no choice of mine it was not due to the deserts of a creature who as yet did not exist can i behold myself thus distinguished without congratulating myself on this post of honour without blessing the hand which bestowed it the first return to self has given birth to a feeling of gratitude and thankfulness to the author of my species and this feeling calls forth my first homage to the beneficent godhead i worship his almighty power and my heart acknowledges his mercies is it not a natural consequence of our self-love to honour our protector and to love our benefactor but when in my desire to find my own place within my species i consider its different ranks and men who fill them where am i now what a sight meets my eyes where is now the order i perceived nature showed me a scene of harmony and proportion the human race shows me nothing but confusion and disorder 
the elements agree together men are in a state of chaos the beasts are happy their king alone is wretched o oh, wisdom where are thy laws o oh, providence is this thy rule over the world merciful god where is thy power i behold the earth and there is evil upon it would you believe it dear friend from these gloomy thoughts and apparent contradictions there was shaped in my mind the sublime idea of the soul which all my seeking had hitherto failed to discover while i meditated upon man's nature i seemed to discover two distinct principles in it one of them raised him to the study of the eternal truths to the love of justice and of true morality to the regions of the world of thought which the wise delight to contemplate the other led him downwards to himself made him the slave of his senses of the passions which are their instruments and thus opposed everything suggested to him by the former principle when i felt myself carried away distracted by these conflicting motives i said no man is not one i will and i will not i feel myself at once a slave and a free man i perceive what is right i love it and i do what is wrong i am active when i listen to the voice of reason i am passive when i am carried away by my passions and when i yield my worst suffering is the knowledge that i might have resisted young man hear me with confidence i will always be honest with you if conscience is the creature of prejudice i am certainly wrong and there is no such thing as a proof of morality but if to put oneself first is an inclination natural to man and if the first sentiment of justice is moreover inborn in the human heart let those who say man is a simple creature remove these contradictions and i will grant that there is but one substance you will note that by this term substance i understand generally the being endowed with some primitive quality apart from all special and secondary modifications if then all the primitive qualities which are known to us can be united in one and the same being we should only acknowledge one substance but if there are qualities which are mutually exclusive there are as many different substances as there are such exclusions you will think this over for my part whatever locke may say it is enough for me to recognize matter as having merely extension and divisibility to convince myself that it cannot think and if a philosopher tells me that trees feel and rocks think in vain will he perplex me with his cunning arguments i merely regard him as a dishonest sophist who prefers to say that stones have feeling rather than that men have souls footnote it seems to me that modern philosophy far from saying that rocks think has discovered that men do not think it perceives nothing more in nature than sensitive beings and the only difference it finds between a man and a stone is that a man is a sensitive being which experiences sensations and a stone is a sensitive being which does not experience sensations and if it is true that all matter feels where shall i find the sensitive unit the individual ego shall it be in each molecule of matter or in bodies as aggregates of molecules shall i place this unity in fluids and solids alike in compounds and in elements you tell me nature consists of individuals but what are these individuals is a stone an individual or an aggregate of individuals is it a single sensitive being or are there as many beings in it as there are grains of sand if every elementary atom is a sensitive being how shall i conceive of that intimate communication by which one feels within the other so that their two egos are blended in one attraction may be a law of nature whose mystery is unknown to us but at least we conceive that there is nothing in attraction acting in proportion to mass which is contrary to extension and divisibility can you conceive of sensation in the same way the sensitive parts have extension but the sensitive being is one and indivisible he cannot be cut in two he is a whole or he is nothing 
therefore the sensitive being is not a material body i know not how our materialists understand it but it seems to me that the same difficulties which have led them to reject thought should have made them also reject feeling and i see no reason why when the first step has been taken they should not take the second too what more would it cost them since they are certain they do not think why do they dare to affirm that they feel and footnote suppose a deaf man denies the existence of sounds because he has never heard them i put before his eyes a stringed instrument and cause it to sound in unison by means of another instrument concealed from him the deaf man sees the cord vibrate i tell him the sound makes it do that not at all says he the string itself is the cause of the vibration to vibrate in that way is a quality common to all bodies then show me this vibration in other bodies i answer or at least show me its cause in this string i cannot replies the deaf man but because i do not understand how this string vibrates why should i try to explain it by means of your sounds of which i have not the least idea it is explaining one obscure fact by means of a cause still more obscure make me perceive your sounds or i say there are no such things the more i consider thought and the nature of the human mind the more likeness i find between the arguments of the materialists and those of the deaf man indeed they are deaf to the inner voice which cries aloud to them in a tone which can hardly be mistaken a machine does not think there is neither movement nor form which can produce reflection something within thee tries to break the bands which confine it space is not thy measure the whole universe does not suffice to contain thee thy sentiments thy desires thy anxiety thy pride itself have another origin than this small body in which thou art imprisoned no material creature is in itself active and i am active in vain do you argue this point with me i feel it and it is this feeling which speaks to me more forcibly than the reason which disputes it i have a body which is acted upon by other bodies and it acts in turn upon them there is no doubt about this reciprocal action but my will is independent of my senses i consent or i resist i yield or i win the victory and i know very well in myself when i have done what i have wanted and when i have merely given way to my passions i have always the power to will but not always the strength to do what i will when i yield to temptation i surrender myself to the action of external objects when i blame myself for this weakness i listen to my own will alone i am a slave in my vices a free man in my remorse the feeling of freedom is never effaced in me but when i myself do wrong and when i at length prevent the voice of the soul from protesting against the authority of the body i am only aware of will through the consciousness of my own will and intelligence is no better known to me when you ask me what is the cause which determines my will it is my turn to ask what cause determines my judgment for it is plain that these two causes are but one and if you understand clearly that man is active in his judgments that his intelligence is only the power to compare and judge you will see that his freedom is only a similar power or one derived from this he chooses between good and evil as he judges between truth and falsehood if his judgment is at fault he chooses amiss what then is the cause that determines his will it is his judgment and what is the cause that determines his judgment it is his intelligence his power of judging the determining cause is in himself beyond that i understand nothing no doubt i am not free not to desire my own welfare i am not free to desire my own hurt but my freedom consists in this very thing that i can will what is for my own good or what i esteem as such without any external compulsion 
does it follow that i am not my own master because i cannot be other than myself the motive power of all action is in the will of a free creature we can go no farther it is not the word freedom that is meaningless but the word necessity to suppose some action which is not the effect of an active motive power is indeed to suppose effects without cause to reason in a vicious circle either there is no original impulse or every original impulse has no antecedent cause and there is no will properly so called without freedom man is therefore free to act and as such he is animated by an immaterial substance that is the third article of my creed from these three you will easily deduce the rest so that i need not enumerate them if man is at once active and free he acts of his own accord what he does freely is no part of the system marked out by providence and it cannot be imputed to providence providence does not will the evil that man does when he misuses the freedom given to him neither does providence prevent him doing it either because the wrong done by so feeble a creature is as nothing in his eyes or because it could not prevent it without doing a greater wrong and degrading his nature providence has made him free that he may choose the good and refuse the evil it has made him capable of this choice if he uses rightly the faculties bestowed upon him but it has so strictly limited his powers that the misuse of his freedom cannot disturb the general order the evil that man does reacts upon himself without affecting the system of the world without preventing the preservation of the human species in spite of itself to complain that god does not prevent us from doing wrong is to complain because he has made man of so excellent a nature that he has endowed his actions with that morality by which they are ennobled that he has made virtue man's birthright supreme happiness consists in self-content that we may gain this self-content we are placed upon this earth and endowed with freedom we are tempted by our passions and restrained by conscience what more could divine power itself have done on our behalf could it have made our nature a contradiction and have given the prize of well-doing to one who was incapable of evil to prevent a man from wickedness should providence have restricted him to instinct and made him a fool not so o god of my soul i will never reproach thee that thou hast created me in thine own image that i may be free and good and happy like my maker it is the abuse of our powers that makes us unhappy and wicked our cares our sorrows our sufferings are of our own making moral ills are undoubtedly the work of man and physical ills would be nothing which have made us liable to them has not nature made us feel our needs as a means to our preservation is not bodily suffering a sign that the machine is out of order and needs attention death do not the wicked poison their own life and ours who would wish to live for ever death is a cure for the evils you bring upon yourself nature would not have you suffer perpetually how few sufferings are felt by man living in a state of primitive simplicity his life is almost entirely free from suffering and from passion he neither fears nor feels death if he feels it his sufferings make him desire it henceforth it is no evil in his eyes if we were but content to be ourselves we should have no cause to complain of our lot but in the search for an imaginary good we find a thousand real ills he who cannot bear a little pain must expect to suffer greatly if a man injures his constitution by dissipation you try to cure him with medicine the ill he fears is added to the ill he feels the thought of death makes it horrible and hastens its approach the more we seek to escape from it the more we are aware of it and we go through life in the fear of death blaming nature for the evils we have inflicted on ourselves by our neglect of her laws o oh man seek no further for the author of evil 
thou art he there is no evil but the evil you do or the evil you suffer and both come from yourself evil in general can only spring from disorder and in the order of the world i find a never-failing system evil in particular cases exists only in the mind of those who experience it and this feeling is not the gift of nature but the work of man himself pain has little power over those who having thought little look neither before nor after take away our fatal progress take away our faults and our vices take away man's handiwork and all is well where all is well there is no such thing as injustice justice and goodness are inseparable now goodness is the necessary result of boundless power and of that self-love which is innate to all sentient beings the omnipotent projects himself so to speak into the being of his creatures creation and preservation are the everlasting work of power it does not act on that which has no existence god is not the god of the dead he could not harm and destroy without injury to himself the omnipotent can only will what is good footnote the ancients were right when they called the supreme god optimus maximus but it would have been better to say maximus optimus for his goodness springs from his power he is good because he is great and footnote therefore he who is supremely good because he is supremely powerful must also be supremely just otherwise he would contradict himself for that love of order which creates order we call goodness and that love of order which preserves order we call justice men say god owes nothing to his creatures i think he owes them all he promised when he gave them their being now to give them the idea of something good and to make them feel the need of it is to promise it to them the more closely i study myself the more carefully i consider the more plainly do i read these words be just and you will be happy it is not so however in the present condition of things the wicked prospers and the oppression of the righteous continues observe how angry we are when this expectation is disappointed conscience revolts and murmurs against her creator she exclaims and cries and groans thou hast deceived me i have deceived thee rash soul who told you this is thy soul destroyed hast thou ceased to exist o brutus o my son let there be no stain upon the close of thy noble life do not abandon thy hope and thy glory with thy corpse upon the plains of philippi why dost thou say virtue is not when you art about to enjoy the reward of virtue thou art about to die nay thou shalt live and thus my promise is fulfilled one might judge from the complaints of impatient men that god owes them the reward before they have deserved it that he is bound to pay for virtue in advance oh let us first be good and then we shall be happy let us not claim the prize before we have won it nor demand our wages before we have finished our work it is not in the lists that we crown the victors in the sacred game says plutarch it is when they have finished their course if the soul is immaterial it may survive the body and if it so survives providence is justified had i no other proof of the immaterial nature of the soul the triumph of the wicked and the oppression of the righteous in this world would be enough to convince me i should seek to resolve so appalling a discord in the universal harmony i should say to myself all is not over with life everything finds its place at death i should still have to answer the question what becomes of man when all we know of him through our senses has vanished this question no longer presents any difficult to me when i admit the two substances it is easy to understand that what is imperceptible to those senses escapes me during my bodily life 
when i perceive through my senses only when the union of the soul and body is destroyed i think one may be dissolved and the other may be preserved why should the destruction of one imply the destruction of the other on the contrary so unlike in their nature they were during their union in a highly unstable condition and when this union comes to an end both return to their natural state the active vital substance regains all the force which it expended to set in motion the passive dead substance alas my vices make me only too well aware that man is but half alive during this life the life of the soul only begins with the death of the body but what is that life is the soul of man in its nature immortal i know not my finite understanding cannot hold the infinite what is called eternity eludes my grasp what can i assert or deny how can i reason with regard to what i cannot conceive i believe that the soul survives the body for the maintenance of order who knows if this is enough to make it eternal however i know that the body is worn out and destroyed by the division of its parts but i cannot conceive of a similar destruction of the conscious nature and as i cannot imagine how it can die i presume that it does not die as this assumption is consoling and in itself not unreasonable why should i fear to accept it i am aware of my soul it is known to me in feeling and in thought i know what it is without knowing its essence i cannot reason about ideas which are unknown to me what i do know is this that my personal identity depends upon memory and that to be indeed the same self i must remember that i have existed now after death i could not recall what i was when alive unless i also remembered what i felt and therefore what i did and i have no doubt that this remembrance will one day form the happiness of the good and the torment of the bad in this world our inner consciousness is absorbed by the crowd of eager passions which cheat remorse the humiliation and disgrace involved in the practice of virtue do not permit us to realize its charm but when freed from the illusions of the bodily senses we behold with joy the supreme being and the eternal truths which flow from him when all the powers of our soul are alive to the beauty of order and we are wholly occupied in comparing what we have done with what we ought to have done then it is that the voice of conscience will regain its strength and sway then it is that the pure delight which springs from self-content and the sharp regret for our own degradation of that self will decide by means of overpowering feeling what shall be the fate which each has prepared for himself my good friend do not ask me whether there are other sources of happiness or suffering i cannot tell that which my fancy pictures is enough to console me in this life and to bid me look for a life to come i do not say the good will be rewarded for what greater good can a truly good being expect than to exist in accordance with his nature but i do assert that the good will be happy because their maker the author of all justice who has made them capable of feeling has not made them that they may suffer moreover they have not abused their freedom upon earth and they have not changed their fate through any fault of their own yet they have suffered in this life and it will be made up to them in the life to come this feeling relies not so much on one man's deserts as on the idea of good which seems to me inseparable from the divine essence i only assume that the laws of order are constant and that god is true to himself do not ask me whether the torments of the wicked will endure forever whether the goodness of their creator can condemn them to the eternal suffering again i cannot tell i have no empty curiosity for the investigation of useless problems how does the fate of the wicked concern me i take little interest in it all the same i find it hard to believe that they will be condemned to everlasting torments if the supreme justice calls for vengeance 
it claims it in this life the nations of the world with their errors are its ministers justice uses self-inflicted ills to punish the crimes which have deserved them it is in your own insatiable souls devoured by envy greed and ambition it is in the midst of your false prosperity that the avenging passions find the due reward of your crimes what need to seek a hell in the future life it is here in the breast of the wicked when our fleeting needs are over and our mad desires are at rest there should also be an end of our passions and our crimes can pure spirits be capable of any perversity having need of nothing why should they be wicked if they are free from our gross senses if their happiness consists in the contemplation of other beings they can only desire what is good and he who ceases to be bad can never be miserable this is what i am inclined to think though i have not been at the pains to come to any decision o oh god merciful and good whatever thy decrees may be i adore them if thou shouldst commit the wicked to everlasting punishment i abandon my feeble reason to thy justice but if the remorse of these wretched beings should in the course of time be extinguished if their sufferings should come to an end and if the same peace shall one day be the lot of all mankind i give thanks to thee for this is not the wicked my brother how often have i been tempted to be like him let him be delivered from his misery and freed from the spirit of hatred that accompanied it let him be as happy as i myself his happiness far from arousing my jealousy will only increase my own thus it is that in the contemplation of god in his works and in the study of such as his attributes as it concerned me to know i have solely grasped and developed the idea at first partial and imperfect which i have formed of this infinite being but if this idea has become nobler and greater it is also more suited to the human reason as i approach in spirit the eternal light i am confused and dazzled by its glory and compelled to abandon all the earthly notions which help me to picture it to myself god is no longer corporeal and sensible the supreme mind which rules the world is no longer the world itself in vain do i strive to grasp his inconceivable essence when i think that it is he that gives life and movement to the living and moving substance which controls all living bodies when i hear it said that my soul is spiritual and that god is a spirit i revolt against this abasement of the divine essence as if god and my soul were of one and the same nature as if god were not the one and only absolute being the only really active feeling thinking willing being from whom we derive our thought feeling motion will our freedom and our very existence we are free because he wills our freedom and his inexplicable substance is to our souls what our souls are to our bodies i know not whether he has created matter body soul the world itself the idea of creation confounds me and eludes my grasp so far as i can conceive it i believe it but i know that he has formed the universe and all that is that he has made and ordered all things no doubt god is eternal but can my mind grasp the idea of eternity why should i cheat myself with meaningless words this is what i understand before things were god was he will be when they are no more and if all things come to an end he will still endure that a being beyond my comprehension should give life to other beings this is merely difficult and beyond my understanding but that being and nothing should be convertible terms this is indeed a palpable contradiction an evident absurdity 
End of section 27 God is intelligent, but how? Man is intelligent when he reasons, but the supreme intelligence does not need to reason. There is neither premise nor conclusion for him. There is not even a proposition. The supreme intelligence is wholly intuitive. It sees what is and what shall be. All truth are one for it, as all places are but one point, and all time but one moment. Man's power makes use of means. The divine power is self-active. God can because he wills. His will is his power. God is good. This is certain. But man finds his happiness in the welfare of his kind. God's happiness consists in the love of order, for it is through order that he maintains what is and unites each part in the whole. God is just of this i am sure it is a consequence of his goodness man's injustice is not the work of god but his own that moral justice which seems to the philosophers a presumption against providence is to me a proof of its existence but man's justice consists in giving to each his due god's justice consists in demanding from each of us an account of that which he has given us if i have succeeded in discerning these attributes of which i have no absolute idea it is in the form of unavoidable deductions and by the right use of my reason but i affirm them without understanding them and at bottom that is no affirmation at all in vain do i say god is thus i feel it i experience it none the more do i understand how god can be thus in a word the more i strive to envisage his infinite essence the less do i comprehend it but it is and that is enough for me the less i understand the more i adore i abase myself saying being of beings i am because thou art to fix my thoughts on thee is to ascend to the source of my being the best use i can make of my reason is to resign it before thee my mind delights my weakness rejoices to feel myself overwhelmed by thy greatness having thus deduced from the perception of objects of sense and from my inner consciousness which leads me to judge of causes by my native reason principal truths which i require to know i must now seek such principles of conduct as i can draw from them and such rules as i must lay down for my guidance in the fulfilment of my destiny in this world according to the purpose of my maker 